Okay, I want to go over your photo assignment number three. This is really one of the most important uh, things that we'll do in the class, and it deals with the three elements of manipulation that are very important for you in using your camera. Now, there are obviously some big differences in the cameras used in this class. We have people that are using some very sophisticated single lens reflex cameras, and we have some people that are using some very inexpensive but still good point-and-shoot cameras. The reality is the point-and-shoot cameras don't have the same capacity as the bigger cameras and of course you would expect that. Pretty much all the cameras that I'm familiar with will have the ability to do some manipulation with aperture, with shutter, and with ISO. Now the top photo here of these SLRs, uh, one being Canon and one being Nikon. You're going to be familiar with these dials here and you're going to set the dials. For example on the Nikon, P stands for program, same on the Canon, and then shutter, aperture, and manual. And it's the same uh, shutter, aperture, and manual, although Canon has a little bit different way of putting it. Now on your point and shoot cameras you'll have a similar dial and typically it will have an A for aperture, an S for shutter, perhaps uh, a P for program or it might just say auto. But anyway, what we're going to start with is the aperture. Aperture is the opening of your lens. And here's a key concept for you. We measure this in f-stop and f-stop is the size of the hole that the light will go through on your lens. And a typical camera lens, even on a fixed point and shoot camera, is going to have a range and it may not be this low, 1.4. It may start at say 2.8. Nevertheless, you're going to have a range up to at least f8. There are decisions that you're going to make about which aperture setting you're going to use. Now remember you have to go back to your camera and put it on A for the aperture mode and that is going to give you the ability to change the amount of light coming through by changing the hole. Your camera is going to change the shutter speed to compensate for it. Camera is going to have to let in the amount of light that will do the best job of giving you a photo. So you can control that with the amount of light going through by making the hole bigger or smaller, or you can do things with a shutter or the other element, ISO, which we'll get to in a minute. So when you set your camera for the aperture priority mode, what you're really doing is you're going to control for this depth of field. And depth of field is uh, sometimes a difficult concept but basically if we look at the two photographs here of a tape measure and we can see that they're going away from us so this is the closest to the camera and this is the furthest from the camera with the depth of field on setting uh, your f-stop at 3.2 once you get down here around this area it starts to fuzz out so from maybe about here to here, this is where you have your greatest depth of field, and this is where stuff will appear to be in focus. Now if we make the hole smaller, and that means increasing the f-stop number, smaller hole, bigger f-stop number, then we are actually extending the depth of field. So it'll go back here oh somewhere in this vicinity where it starts to fuzz out. Let's look at another example here. We've got three photographs of a guy sitting here in a similar position, same background, same lighting, but on this photograph we have set with the aperture priority mode the f-stop to be 2.8 what that is doing is the depth of field is really pretty much on this guy and the background is all uh, basically blurry or fuzzed out or unsharp or not in focus whatever you want to call it as we move 
the f-stop to be smaller, whole, higher f-stop number, two things. One is your shutter has to stay open longer. So for this first one where we have the depth of field pretty much around the guy here, this is shot at 1 500th of a second. This one is shot at 1 60th of a second. That's quite a difference. You'll see that this background is actually a little more in focus. And if we go all the way to f22, which a lot of cameras frankly won't get as far down as f22 that's a pretty small hole in, for your lens as a result the shutter has to be open one eighth of a second that's a huge difference between a five hundredth of a second and an eighth of a second in fact when you shoot at an eighth of a second very often if you're not rock steady holding the camera you're going to blur a lot of stuff because you're going to jiggle the camera particularly if you have a longer telephoto lens so anyway, this uh, guy here with the F22, uh, pretty much the background is actually in focus. All right, here's another example. We have a lineup of crayons, Crayolas, that are uh, going away from you. So with F1.4, that's a big hole, and really just this first one is going to be in focus. If we do F16, very small hole, then we can see that more of the crayons are going to be in focus. In fact, it's not until you get to this last few here that it starts to go out of focus. What are you going to do on this particular thing for our aperture mode? You're going to take three photographs of the same subject that shows a variation in the background. In other words, the depth of field. Now please uh, record the camera settings for each photo and include them. Again, what I want you to do is to create a Word document and then insert the photos in the Word document and then put the caption of what your camera setting was for each photo underneath. I'm really sure that some of you that have a point-and-shoot camera will, will struggle a little bit with this assignment and let me just say that that's okay. If you have any particular questions, please contact me through the Blackboard message. But this is kind of what I'm looking for. We got one constant image and with the f-stop set at the biggest opening you can get and then we've got a middle one and then we've got one where it's at the smallest opening you can get. And if you can see what your shutter speed changes please record that. SLR people should be able to see that. Actually, once you've taken the picture on an SLR camera, that information is there. Let's turn to the shutter now. We use shutter priority, particularly when we're trying to do things with the motion of the subject. So here's some vehicles that are zooming by a highway, and this is pretty much what the assignment will be on this. I, I recommend you, you just try to replicate this same type of thing here. In this first one, you're going to set your shutter speed for about a 250th of a second. That's pretty fast. You're not going to shake the camera a whole lot. And it should stop the action. If you want to set it at 1 500th of a second, that's fine. In this one, pretty much the vehicle looks like it's stopped. In 1 30th of a second, which you're going to have to hold pretty steady, for 1 30th of a second, you can see that there is this sense of motion. And this is actually sometimes desirable in a shot. You may want to see some sort of blurring that gives the impression of speed. Now over here you're going to go 1 4th of a second is frankly very difficult to achieve with a handheld. You might try 1 8th of a second and hold your breath and hold your camera steady. Just give this a try. Do the best you can on it, okay? That's one part of what we're going to do for this shutter piece of this. There are some times when you want to actually capture your subject that's in motion by swinging the camera to be following it, essentially. This is called panning. In this shot here with the car, you see the car is basically captured as a still image, but the background is blurred in a particular way that gives it a sense of motion. Sometimes this is a desired effect. And then the 
third type of photograph that I want you to attempt is one, and I've, I've already seen some that you've turned in of some waterfalls, some of which were very beautiful photographs. If we have a fast shutter, like this one is 160th of a second, you're actually going to freeze the drops of water as they come over. And then if you shoot at a slow, and this is one third of a second, and again that's pretty slow for handheld, but see what you can do. This gives that kind of, uh, oh, ethereal effect. Uh, we see this a lot in uh, nature photography, and it's, it's really a great effect. So, for the shutter part of this, you're going to take three photographs of the same subject, think in terms of these cars going by. It, and I, it doesn't have to be the same car. You can just catch this car going at this speed, catch another car going at this, and another car going at this. All right, don't make somebody drive past your house six times or whatever. Okay, and then you're going to get a car that's going by, but you're going to follow the car and then take the picture and see if you can freeze the car and make the background appear to have the motion. And then finally on this waterfall thing, uh, see if you can do something. And, and it doesn't have to be a waterfall, but the waterfall's not moving. Uh, I mean, the water's moving, but, but this shot, you can just take this shot and then change your uh, settings and then take another shot. So something like this would be great. Now, ISO, this is the third element, and this is actually kind of a technical term and it comes from the International Standards uh, Association or organization rather, ISO. And uh, back in the days when we had film camera, uh, you would buy different films for your camera based on sensitivity. So you would have maybe an ISO 100 if you're going to shoot outside, and you might buy ISO 800 if you're going to shoot uh, maybe a, a sporting event where you had to try and freeze the action and you needed more variability with your shutter and aperture. Then you could also take photographs inside with lower light with a ISO 800. Well, we're using cameras that are essentially computers and they have a chip that's a sensor chip like this one right here. The chip does amazing things. So we can go ahead and we can set our ISO setting uh, on your camera and again get your book. If you don't have your book, Google your camera name brand and use the word manual and I'm pretty sure you're gonna find what you need and have an online version of your book. So just try setting some different ISO settings. Why don't you just shoot at ISO 1600 all the time? Well because when you increase the ISO level to a high rate you're actually going to add a kind of visual noise into your photograph and you're going to see this uh, sometimes called grain. So if you see this ISO 100 photograph you can see how sharp everything is here and then if you see this ISO 1600 photograph and many cameras go to 1600 some cameras will go to 6400 that just means more grain when you do that but if it makes the difference of getting the shot and being able to take the shot let's say you go to a birthday party and it's pretty dark in there and you don't want to use the flash we'll get into flash later then crank up the ISO as high as you can the pictures will have a little bit of noise in them but it's better than not having the pictures so what do I want you to do in turn in on this two photographs of the same thing just using different ISO levels and again record what your camera tells you put these in a document and send it to me through Blackboard and that is the assignment uh, that relates to these critical elements aperture shutter and ISO please be sure to contact me if you have any questions